Well, I was pre-digital uh, during the Depression and always face-to-face. -face. Always. Very rare occasion by telephone. So you would just go and to people's houses and find them when or you they, wanted to talk with them? They would find me or we'd meet on the street, on the street <laughs> corner usually. Yeah. Telephones then were different. There was a coin box. You had to put in a nickel, five cent piece. And once a month, a representative from the telephone company came and emptied, the, counted them, put them in his black bag, told you how many there were. And if they were in excess of the, some number, he gave you back some money because if you made more than some particular number of calls, you got a share of that money back. Almost all my friends uh, in elementary school, in high school, were living in the same block. And in high school, we'd meet in class or around the school. This was almost obeying orders. We learned to read and write, do arithmetic, uh, use proper grammar, managed to obtain a legible handwriting. The average class size never varied. It was 48, always 48. Six rows of eight. In most of the classes, you were ranked. First row, first seat was the smartest, usually a girl. Okay, I went to high school, mm -hmm. then junior college, two years in the city system in Chicago. Then the army was four years. When I came back, uh, the universe was different, and I was different. And I went right to the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. which was heavily populated by veterans. Everyone had the same attitude, which was every hour you were not busy, every hour was one-eighth of a day before you were on somebody's payroll. In the period prior to being admitted to research, this is a critical step, the prelims, mm -hmm. the past prelims, you know about those. Then studying was intense. The rules for getting through, uh, there were four prelims, you had past four. But the studying was uh, fun. I mean, were, studying was social. And we kept throwing problems at each other. What if, what if, what if? I finally left that phase when I first encountered nuclear magnetic resonance, which is the machine that's used for MRI. Starting in graduate school, uh, the professor says, here are several problems uh, that I know about that are important. And you discuss them, and uh, you come to an agreement on one of them. In 1951, I went across the street to join the Ben May Laboratory for Cancer Research. This was uh, hand, uh, uh, hands-on, constant hands-on and innovating. I was, I think I've had an invention a week. Uh, it's literally uh, something that didn't work. Oh, you know, I've got to do it this way. And it was, it was new, brand new. Mm -hmm. I kept doing brand new things. So I came to Albany and 1964. Now I've been here in this job, 12 in Chicago, 50 and a half here. The school picked the date. There's a celebration of 50 years on the job. The drive is to produce uh, an effective, convincing grant application. An enormous amount of literature is searched to make sure you're on the right track always. If you're funded, then you're busy doing what you said you want to do and which the funding agency agrees you should have the money with which to do it. That's where we are now. The money shows up in a couple of weeks. So what I'm doing now, making sure that what we said we want to do, the way we want to do it, is still the best way. The work that's been sought in a succession of successful grant applications now quite a few years there's a drug to prevent breast cancer and uh, in reviewing what we had googling stumbled on a lead which says this same drug ought to be a successful treatment for u uterine fibroids in women uterine fibroids in women are a great concern the methods are not so good inadvertently the newest one has killed several women so it may well be a, just a pill it's an amazing thing. That's what can happen at this stage of research. In a few weeks, we'll be very busy doing what we said we intend to do.
I hear the term estrogen receptor. Some cells are stimulated by estrogen. Some are not. Many, most are not. The cell has to recognize that there's estrogen. So there's a protein in the cell that combines with estrogen. And only when that happens does the cell respond and says, aha, estrogen is here and it does what it does when estrogen is there. So I discovered it, okay? Estrogen receptor. Now, if you want to know if something is responsive to estrogen, you can get a sample of the tissue and just do a, a chemical analysis to see if it contains the estrogen receptor. It's a big deal because it's applied to all breast cancer specimens and many other cancer specimens to find out whether they are, whether the woman should be treated as if she has an estrogen-driven cancer or not. Off the cuff, I'd say this has probably saved the lives of a quarter million women, maybe more. But the best thing is not to know how to treat breast cancer, but to prevent it. And that's what we're trying to do. Well, I was in the signal corps doing that kind of stuff for a long time. And uh, the conversation then was with people at other stations. Most of that, most of the, all of that was from somewhere in New Guinea, different places in New Guinea, in Milton Bay, Port Moresby, Finch Haven, Hollandia. After the second A-bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, well, we, at the station we were working at at that time, was in a former rice paddy, and they were water buffalo, and et cetera. But the, there were antennas, great rhombic antennas. There were telephone poles, four of them in the shape, located diamond shape with wires up high, and they were aimed at another station. They were targeted. And uh, it was on the night shift. Dawn came, and the riggers came, the people who climbed. And they climbed up. There was one antenna that was oriented to Vladivostok, expecting communication with the Russians. We were on the same side, but they never engaged in any communication, so that was idle. And these guys climbed up and dropped, they called it a curtain, dropped the wires and pulled it up again. What are they doing? They're reorienting to Japan. We were given um, the device called a crystal, which determines the frequency in which you're broadcasting. And then it was curious why Pearl changed the Pearl, changed the road. And then after a long time, we walked around wondering what the heck's going to happen, he got a response, which was, we hear you. We hear you. And then they began negotiating about a surrender. It was exciting. I'm not young enough to be um, an instinctive computer user. Most of what I do is search uh, for recent publications and a heck of a lot of time on PubMed. The National Library has everything. 10% of the successful, recognized, famous researchers, and only 10% look at the problem and not at the light. You're following a line of research and I can make this be a solution to breast cancer. And they work and work and work and work and work. And uh, they advance the field. There's a great deal of valuable information. But my selfish opinion is they're not advancing breast cancer. Don't go over there. Don't go in the light. Go where the problem is. I hope maybe I've inspired you to do that too. Don't work under the lamppost.